Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Let's Run.com's Track Talk podcast, a special edition, afternoon edition. Our first afternoon recording, folks. It's been a long night with me with a new baby. To get myself pumped up, I need to play a little music. Weldon and I were dancing in the background. Welcome to the podcast, Weldon and John. What would you guys think of the intro music? Uh, I hope you guys liked it. The listeners, I mean, because I, I really wish that our listeners could have seen video of this because... Robert and Weldon, they're usually pretty hip guys. They're in their 40s. They're good over a decade older than me, but usually I think they're pretty relatable. These guys looked like ancient monoliths, you know, dancing. They, so, zomb, I don't know if zombie is the right word, but they just showed their age with their dance moves to this song. And Weldon, it was like a childlike excitement, but it was also that kind of dad excitement. Like, ooh, look at this cool thing that I discovered that isn't actually that cool. We have a much younger audience now with the music, John. you got to embrace it. People otherwise are going to be very depressed in the morning. I'm reading a new book, When, by Daniel Pink. Two o'clock, it's when people are depressed. we got to pick them up, pick ourselves up for a great podcast. We've got to be hitting on all cylinders. Speaking of books, we've got a sponsor's plug. There's a new book out, Fast 5K, by Let's Run.com reader Pete McGill. If you want to run a faster 5K, this book's for you. Check it out. It'll be in the show notes, as will the link to win by daniel pink which i just talked about it's a pretty cool book how to manage your day better and our good buddy malcolm gladwell has a new book out as well everyone should read that so there you go three book plugs but so much to talk about this week guys the first ever marathon grand championships are in the books jeffrey camor has broken the world half marathon record elijah manigo and dathan ritzenheim are both injured and out of action jordan has say is back in action but running slowly we have our message board thread of the week, our term of the week, our question of the week, and our training tip of the week. Where to begin? Jonathan, you're the young guy. Oh, by the way, about the dance moves, one last thing. My wife's fear, she is a decade younger than me, is that I'm going to be the one that tries to teach our son how to dance. She does agree with you that Walden and I are terrible, terrible dancers. We like to use our hands in a weird, somewhat effeminate way, I think. Anyways, John, take over the podcast, please. Uh, yeah, Robert, let's talk about the Marathon Grand Championship. This was held on Sunday morning, Japan, Saturday night, U.S. time. First ever marathon Olympic trials for Japan. And it was awesome. I mean, we had high expectations. The men's race totally lived up to the hype. We had, you know, eight guys battling the final 5K, four guys in the final couple miles. Ended up Shogo Nakamura got the upset win there with Yuma Hattori, who won Fukuoka last year in second. Suguru Osako of the Nike Oregon Project third. And then on the women's side, Honami Maeda got the win there. And that was also something of an upset. Uh, the 23-year-old taking the victory there with Ayuko Suzuki and Rei Ohara taking the next two spots on the team. What an amazing an event. I mean, this event far exceeded expectations. We had huge expectations, you and I, John, and I think it exceeded it. 21 guys with sub-210 PRs started this race. In the history of the United States of America, only 20 Americans have broken 210. Brett Larner of Japan Running News blogspot.com labeled it the hardest marathon to qualify in the history of the world. And I guess he's probably right, right, John? But the men's race, you've got the three people making the team, assuming no one breaks the national record between now and March. But with the Nike Oregon Project Seguro Osaka holding on to the third spot currently. But you also had the drama, John, of your favorite guy, Yuta Shitara, the former national record holder. He said, I don't want to run 214 and 215. That's boring. He goes out in 66 flat on a hot day and blows up. What do you think of that? To me, I'm going to give, give him the dumbest award of, of, of the week. Well, he didn't go out in 66 flat. He went out in 63.27. I mean, this guy, he was on... 206 pace through halfway and yeah i mean it, it was awesome to watch you're just thinking it, it was amazing within one kilometer this guy was like 10 seconds up on the pack so it was insane to see that but i was thinking the same thing i'm like well this is going to be one of the most impressive hot because it was in the 70s so one of the most impressive hot weather marathon performances i've ever seen or it's going to totally blow up in his face and the latter occurred. And I think it was great drama, but in terms of a racing tactic, yeah, I think it was dumb. I mean, I know he's a 206 guy, but 206 doesn't usually win the Olympic marathon. Yeah, I thought this thing was amazing just in terms of drama. 
if our marathon trials could be this good, especially on the men's side, I mean, the races were just sick, but he goes out into a six pace and about halfway in, I'm like, this, there's no way he keeps this up. It's too hot. It was just very stupid tactically. But I mean, the whole thing, this just shows how great the Olympics could be next year. They shouldn't be when they're going to be held. It's going to be way too hot. It's going to be hotter than this. There's a bunch of problems with it, but Japan is marathon mad. And you saw this with the trials. Both trials were held simultaneously, both on different national television station, stations in Japan. They would cut in and show highlights from the other race. It's just crazy that this thing happened. And then the drama at the end, eight guys kicking. You got Osako of the NOP sort of hanging back. And then he catches the leader. And you're like, oh, my gosh, he's got it. And he's kind of the only guy I really knew once you know, the leader fell back because it's in, being dra- broadcast in Japanese. But I could appreciate just the beauty and the drama. You didn't need to know anything more than that. And then just the way it sort of played out with Osako missing the final automatic spot. It was crazy. Speaking of the two TV channels, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but have you seen the TV ratings? Don't yell them out if you've seen them. Yes or no, have you seen the TV ratings? No. I thought I saw – I might have seen a number. I no, I don't remember for sure. But. Well, we'll start with Weldon then. They just came out, and I wrote Brett Lorner in Japan and said, hey, have you heard anything about the TV ratings? He said, no, I haven't, but they'll be out soon, and I'll publish it on my website. And he's just put them up. Guess what the TV ratings were? What – Combined between the men and women, what percent of televisions in Japan were on watching the Olympic marathon trials? Percent of TVs on? I was going to say thirty, but I'm going to now go fifty percent. Was it, it now? I don't. Want, I don't want to cheat here because I think I saw forty. Is that right, Robert? Was forty the number? Incorrect, John. Weldon, folks, this is like when you're taking that SAT and you're you're deciding between A and B, and you can't decide. Go with your gut instinct. Weldon's thirty percent gut instinct was dead on. Twenty nine point nine percent. The men's race being a little bit more popular at 16.4% and the women getting 13.5%. That's a, wait, I want to talk about that. That's interesting to me that they were almost even because I feel like, uh, I, do you think that would be the split in the United States if they showed the men's and women's marathon trials simultaneously? What do you think the split would be? Well, I, I, I don't know. When I saw that, I was a little bit surprised about it too, particularly in Japan, which I think is more macho than, than America. I mean, a little bit more male dominated. Um, but I'm more thinking about it, like how sophisticated are these TV ratings? Is it really the same? Maybe it's the same 15% switching back and forth. Yeah, it's a little bit higher. I, mean, I, I think it's, you could basically have all the hardcore running fans watching both races. But I guess I'm wondering, like, is, does it just break down along gender lines? Like, do men just watch the men's race and women watch the women's race? Or are there some men watching the women's race and some women watching the men's race? I'm kind of curious how that split is. Yeah, I mean, to me, I mean, the women's race just wasn't as compelling. You only had 10 starters. It was a blowout victory. You know, if I was watching both, I would have ended up watching the men's race at the end. Um, You know, one thing, and I guess they don't really want to close down the TV, the the street of, you know, Tokyo for two different events. I I don't like the idea, again, of running both events at the same time. I, I think it's, you know, let each people shine on their own. But what you saw here is something people were starting to listen to the Let's Run.com. The Rojo Marathon advice for the meet managers, start the men's race first. It gives you more time because the men run faster. So they started about 20 minutes apart, but the men run, you know, 15 minutes faster than the women. So then you have a 25 minute gap. Yeah, but you want the gap to be bigger, don't you? Your complaint is that 25 minutes is No, one race should be ending when the other one is at halfway and certainly not longer than 30K. So that is the... Free let's run advice, daily advice. There's so much daily advice. I just need to start my own consultancy company. But it, it, it was amazing. And the crowds on the side were like three, four deep. I would love to know an estimate of the crowd. But Robert, if they start, if they do this for non qualifying marathons and they start them in first, then you'd complain that the people's champion was excluded from the race. I'm always going to complain about something. Correct. <laughs> but how about the name Marathon Grand Championships? It just sounds really cool. I, mean, I always thought it couldn't get, get any better than Olympic mar- marathon trials, but I think we should start a race here and just call it Marathon Grand Championships. Well, yeah, they had Marathon Grand Championship written in English characters on the bibs, which I found interesting as well. Like, we need to find, we need to come up with some awesome Japanese name and write Japanese characters on the U.S. Olympic trials bibs. Maybe after you know the marathon season's over, we should get Brett Lerner on the podcast. I'd be interesting to know kind of what's happened to women's Japanese marathoning. It used to be so strong. 
you had, you know, Naoko Takahashi. She had the world record. She was the 2000 Olympic champion. And now, and the men weren't that good. And now the men are much better than the women. And only like 10 women actually qualified for this race. So I don't have any theories on that. I assume you guys don't either. But if you do, speak up. One thing that was interesting to me about the women in the Japan race is I think like only one or two of the 10 women had a college degree. Very interesting how they go straight from the high school ranks, it seems, to the pro teams. They don't really run the college system, it looks like. Or if they do, they don't graduate. Yeah, which is weird because the men's – it's not like they do that in the men. The men, the collegiate academic scene is, is really big, and that's their development system. So it's an interesting difference. Now, one thing I thought is very interesting is the wrinkle about third place. So third place in these races is provisionally on the team, but not for sure. And that's because the Japanese, they institute this thing called the final challenge which means that if you run faster than the fastest time that was run during the the qualifying window for this race, you kick the third placer off the team. And so for men, it's the national record because the national record was set last year. So you have to run faster than 205.50. For the women, 222.22 was the fastest time. So that's what they have to run to kick the third placer off. I think it's fascinating because now Yuta Shatara, he's obviously the non-qualifying position. He has to go and race one of their winter marathons, which is either Tokyo, uh, Lake Biwa, or Fukuoka. Fukuoka is in December, so that's probably not going to happen. But again, also, Shatara ran a marathon two months ago in Gold Coast. He ran 207. That's another thing we could maybe talk about. So he's coming in like after running 207 two months ago. But anyway, th- so he can chase those. And I guess if you're Suguru Osako, who's currently in third, do you run one of those races to try to play defense on Shatara and make sure you beat him? Or do you just sit it out and you know plan your, the rest of your schedule accordingly? I think it's great because I'm not sure what you do, but like those guys are Japan's two best marathoners, I would say. And there's a chance, well, I guess one of them really couldn't be on the team, but they both sort of have, it's like this prisoner's dilemma. They both have this incentive to go out and possibly chase the time. Osaka only needs to do it if he wants to sort of like preemptively block Shitara. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I think they'll both probably run. Oh, the Olympics is pretty early this year. I think they'll both probably run one of them. I think they'll both run Tokyo. This is a no brainer. You both, you run Tokyo anyways. I mean, it's, it's in February. You got this, you got, or is it March? Uh, into February, I think. So you got plenty of time to get ready for February, and then it gives you a perfect time for a fill, b- f- perfect buildup for the Olympics. So I, I wouldn't play defense anything. I would just do – he's a marathoner. What else is he going to do in the winter? Um, I, I wouldn't be worried about him breaking the national record. That's not why I would run it. I would I would just do what I thought was best for me, but getting a nice paycheck in, in Tokyo wouldn't hurt it. And remember, both these guys did break the national record during the buildup. For these trials, so both of them won like close to a million dollars. I think it was a million Japanese yen or something. So they're not hurting financially, you know. That, that's for some. One thing I was thinking about it was how what would this be the comparable to of America? So you had one national record holder, the former national record holder, going out hard, and then the current national record holder coming up and you know end up not winning. So I kind of thought of you know, as like who would go out like an idiot and or go out really hard? Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall, bingo. Ryan Hall goes out, but unlike Boston where it's not that hot, he blows up and fades badly to the team. Ritz and High, I mean, I mean, Galen Rupp runs a boring slash cowardly, I mean, no, excuse me, boring race. I should have said cowardly slash boring. Okay, boring race and sits in the pack and you assume he's going to catch everybody, but then now some dude like Scott Fobble wins it and, and then Rupp only gets third. It would be really amazing if this was been the American equivalent of the race. But um, yeah, well, I think the big difference is Rupp is just so much better than everyone else in America. Whereas in Japan, Asako is the national record holder, but clearly he's not that much better. I mean, he was only third in the race, so the the top level depth is there in Japan. It's not in the United States. But I think the comparison was good if you're talking, you know, peak Ryan Hall and peak Galen Rupp. Sort of the analogy is close enough. You could see it, and then some other guy beats both of them. And essentially, even with Osaka, like he's sitting there, he's stalking the leader, Nakamura, the whole time. Pretty much with under a K to go, pulls up right on him. He's been behind. You're like, okay, he's got this thing. He's going to just win this thing. And all of a sudden, he like blows up. No, it doesn't blow up. But in you know one kilometer, he loses 13 seconds, finishes third. So that would be Galen Rupp fading back to third. 
And then meanwhile, like Ryan Hall blew up completely and you got to like, Hey, do I need to block Ryan Hall? So a lot to think about. And I think this shows why the trials need to be promoted in every country if possible. And wild cards need to be given to races like this because our sport needs more races like this. This was beautiful. This was wonderful. And it's what we need. There was one other thing that I didn't notice during the race. And I'm guessing you guys didn't either because none of us freaked out about it, but it was insane is at the 38 K mark Shogo Nakamura, who went on to win the race vomited while running. That's right. He pulled a Bob Kempinen, the 1996 Olympic trials, Dartmouth's finest, Bob Kempinen was running. He threw up while running, just kept going, and then won the trials. And Shogo Nakamura in the first ever Japanese Olympic trials did the exact same thing and won the race. I just thought it was awesome. I did not know that. I did not see that. But I just, for the record, I'm marking it down just a little bit before the 20 minute mark. We get our first Dartmouth reference of the podcast. John gives me a hard time for bringing up Alberto Salazar and Jerry Shoemaker in every podcast. I think we also need to have a rule we bring up Dartmouth. One thing that we have not talked about before we move on, we've got so much other stuff that we need to move on. But And we didn't mention this in our podcast, in, in our recap. I, I, don't, I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere. When that lead pack was down to, what, eight or nine guys in the final 5K, it appeared to me that every single one of them was wearing the Nike, uh, whatever the, the new thing, Zoom. Next percent Vaporfly. is the Vaporfly next percent. Next percent. I mean, these are all, you know, a lot of these guys were wearing Mizuno Asics on their bibs, but they weren't wearing those shoes. So speaking of shoes, folks, if you need shoes, and I know you need them because it's an amazing industry. They self-destruct every few months. You need to go to letsrun.com slash shoes. You can find the reviews and the best prices for whatever shoe you want. If you don't know what shoe you want, you can find a shoe there. And if you don't need shoes right now, just go in there and review your shoe to help others. So letsrun.com slash shoes. The Zoom Vapor 54% gets a 9.1 rating there. And speaking of shoes that don't self-destruct, we wrote an article on the most durable running shoes this week. Google most durable running shoes, let's run.com. You'll find it. We'll also put it in the show notes. But it sort of shows like what the shoe site does. We people rate shoes overall and then on durability, comfort, all these other things. You can sort on those characteristics. You can find shoes for people who run training for marathons, people who overpronate, that sort of thing. Actually, speaking of shoes, we've got the Vaporflies claimed another world record over the weekend, boys. Now the half marathon and the full marathon world records both run in the Nike Vaporflies. Jeffrey Camworo was the man who did it, 5801 in Copenhagen. Very cool thing about this race is they had a a world record finishing tape that was golden. Now, normally I'm against finish tapes, mainly in track races, road races, I think it's fine. But this was awesome. They had obviously prepared it ahead of time in case he was on track to break the world record. And because he broke it easily by 17 seconds, they rolled it out. I was kind of curious, like, what if it was going down to the wire and it was going to be like one or two seconds either way? What do they do? But they got a great picture out of it. And uh, obviously, congrats to Jeffrey on a f- fantastic run. PR, he PR'd from 58.54 down to 58.01. Took down the world record of Abraham Kiptum, 58.18. Doper. Who was later popped for an ABP violation earlier this year. John, giving out the love to the shoes i think we should perhaps give out the love to the training group patrick singh coaches both the half marathon and marathon world record holder and the question i have after watching this 58 to 1 comes out to sub 27 30 it's like 27 29 high per 10,000 meters how sick is that if we could put him in the world championship 10,000 next weekend i mean let's give him a wild card right now john do you think he would run away with it here are your options a definitely run away with it win the gold B, definitely medal, or C, not win a medal. Well, can I say like B and a half? Like, I think he could medal, but I'm not convinced he would medal. I don't think he would run away with it because how far, like, think of how good the guys in this field are. You've got three Ethiopians who have broken 2650 this year. You've got Ronix Cabruto, who ran 2650 in terrible conditions in Stockholm. And then you've got, in my opinion, the best guy in the field, Joshua Cheptegei, the world cross country champion. How is it, Jeffrey Cameron, what did he have to run to drop these guys, like 26-20? I don't know if he can do that. So you seem to think that Chepta guy is just better than Camor. He almost beat him two years ago in World Cross. He did beat him now. You seem to have forgotten, though, that Camor has won several World Cross Country titles himself, John. Perhaps he just didn't do well in the hilly course this year. I mean, Chepta guy smoked him at the most recent World Championships in London. It wasn't even close. Chepta guy got the silver. Camor was nowhere to be seen. Chepta guy won the Diamond League final. He just broke a bunch of 
twelve forty guys in the Diamond League final. I just think he's a stud and Cameroy is probably more I think his best event, we said this, his best event's the half marathon, not the 10K. And again, I'm falling into the trap that I hate about our sport, but I do it all the time myself, is not letting someone run the event that they're actually running, either trying to move them down or up. So, you know, I, I think that in some ways, maybe he realizes, yeah, the half marathon is his best event right now. Just he wants to focus on the marathon. But this, again, it gets me excited for New York to see what he can do there. Maybe it's good just to focus on the roads. It is twice as far. But, John, when you were talking about all your contenders for the medals, you forgot your obvious medal lock in Lopez Lamont. Let's talk about this, folks. If you missed the podcast last week, John basically guaranteed a medal for Lopez. <laughs> and I, 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 I blasphemy didn't guarantee it. I said he could medal in a certain type of race. Okay. And I said, I started laughing and said, absolutely not. I think Weldon agreed with me. And then after the podcast, John, I was thinking to myself, you know what? John said, but he ran 13 flat. It puts him in the contention. He's just as fast as these other guys. And I went back a few years, John. A decade ago. I don't know if you were even following the sport 10 years ago. What were you in high school 10 years ago still, John? Or I uh, just graduated high school starting my freshman year of college. Okay. In 2009, remember this is when the Diamond League, they had Diamond League meets after Worlds, but Mr. Dathan Ritzenheim shocked the world. He ran 1256 for 5,000 meters, which last time I checked is faster than, thir- than 13 flat to get third in Zurich. And this was just a few weeks after the World Championships. Obviously, if he's in that type of shape, John, 1256, he must have medaled at Worlds in 2009. No, he did not. He wasn't even close to a medal. 2009 Worlds, third place, 2657.39, Moses Masai. Dathan Ritzenheim, 25 seconds back of that. He did get sixth place, 2722. What a sick Worlds, though. Yeah, no, that's that's great race. Glad you brought that up, Robert. And uh, I have an answer for you. Have you heard of a guy named Galen Rupp? I have. You have. All right. His 2012 season, he ran 12.58, the Prefontaine Classic, got third place in that race. Third place in the Diamond League. So that's what Ritz did, right? Sub-13, that's also what Ritz did. And do you remember what he did at the Olympics that year, Robert? I believe he got the silver medal. That's right. He got the silver medal. Funny how that works. And you know what the difference was between the two races at the World Championships was the winning time. The winning time at the World Championships in 2009 was 2646. If the winning time is 2646 in Doha, Lopez Lemong does not have a prayer. But the winning time in the London Olympics in 2012 was 2730. If the winning time is 27 and 30 in Doha, I think Lopez Lemong has a serious chance to medal. I think your, your whole logic here is like, oh, this guy ran 1256. And he didn't medal. How does that work? It's like, do you know how many guys run 1256 every year? Quite a lot. Not all of them can medal at Worlds. It's a zero-sum game. So I present my counterexample, Galen Rupp. I still think if the winning times are at 2730 or slower, Lopez has a legitimate shot. If it's faster than 27 flat, I don't think he medals. Uh, John, I, I would say that the biggest difference was not the pace of the race. It was the quality of the race. You seem to think just because it's slower or faster... Let's look at the guys that were in the top three positions. Bekele, 26-46 in 2009. Zersene Tedese, 2650. Moses Masai, 2657. I mean, when you have three super studs like that, it's just hard to medal. Then there was a huge drop off to fourth, 27-15, 27-18, 27-22. And remember, you know, this is a summer race. It's not ideal conditions. That was in Berlin, I think. Well, you know, so. So your, your, your point is, the Olympic final wasn't good enough competition and shouldn't be used as a valid comparison. Well, I guess Bikilis, both Bikilis were in that 2012 race and Tedese and Gepermer. And yes, there were some good guys and Masai actually. <laughs> yeah. There's usually some pretty good guys in the Olympic final, Robert. Oh, this face on your face, this expression on your face is, I love it. I love it. Rojo speechless. I feel like the NLP got the, gets their track medals when no one else is in the race. <laughs> Anyways, it's kind of like the Jenny Simpson 1500 meter plan. Like the people that she couldn't beat somehow all, all screw it up and they do. She does beat them. It's like that's the NLP in the 10,000 marathon. Yeah. Wait, do we want to say anything? We haven't, we didn't mention Alberto specifically in that segment. Do we want to say, is there anything? I guess the Alberto segment of the week would be uh, Jordan to say, we'll get to that in a minute. What I want to talk to talk about though, go back to that half marathon world record. Okay. 
who wins a half marathon if assuming both men train for it and that's their peak event Elliot Kipchoge or Jeffrey Kamwara Kamwara Robert what do you think I have to agree I mean I I think that he's the world record holder why wouldn't he win I mean get, get, it, 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 Kipchoge is amazingly good at the marathon, but we don't. He never really excelled at the ten thousand meters, which still stuns me. How are you so good at the five thousand and the marathon? He, he's shown really no interest in the half marathon. Well, I guess he did run fifty nine twenty five before he really got good at the marathon. So, I'm going Kipchoge. Like we, we just, I mean, we don't know how good he is at the half marathon because he's never trained for it seriously. He trained for the ten k one year, and. One one year that he actually tried to run at the Olympics and didn't make the team. But he ran, I mean, 2649 in 2007, 2654, 2653. He's run faster than, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, he's run faster than Jeffrey Camwara ever has for 10,000 meters. And he's run significantly faster than Camwara in the marathon. I just think if we unleashed Kipchoge on the half marathon, that... I don't know. I think it would be a great race. I'd really love to see it. But I think Eli Kipchoge was a better runner on the track than Kim Waro, and he's a better runner in the marathon. So I think he would be a better runner at the half marathon, even though that is Kim Waro's sweet spot. I mean, we'll never know unless they actually do do it, and I don't think there's enough money to get them to race each other. But one thing, the big difference might be the age. 34 for Kipchoge versus 26 for Kim Waro. How it, This is amazing. Kipchoge's only one year older than Galen Rupp. Like, doesn't he seem like... Well, that's assuming that that age is accurate. My guess is he's probably a year or two older than his stated age. But he's been around the sport since, you know, 2003 when he won, won Worlds on the track. It is pretty crazy if that's his real age or any, anywhere close. He's just been around for so long. But speaking of marathons in the fall, there was some interesting Chicago news. I think two pieces of news of note. Number one, well, this isn't huge, but Dathan Ritzenhain is out of the Chicago Marathon. And John, you confirm that via email, or I think you maybe talked to Ritz on the phone. But the reason you reached out to Ritz was first, there was a thread on Let's Run.com. And maybe this should be the thread of the week. It was called Rupp and Ritz are out of Chicago. And the initial poster swears that both of them are out. So the other shoe has not dropped yet. Reach out to, he said, Ritz excuse me, Rupp is still going to run Chicago. So we need Rupp in Chicago. I mean, we don't need him. We got Mo Farah in that race as well and some other good guys, but it's a much better race via Farah and Rupp squaring off again. Yeah, well, the interesting thing about this thread is he, the person who started it claims to be the same person who started a thread last year predicting that Amy Craig and Jordan Assay would scratch from Chicago. And both of them ended up scratching. So... I thought it was interesting. I at least figured I'd try to follow up. And yeah, I texted Ritz and he said, yeah, I'm out. And then I emailed Ricky Sims, who's Galen's agent. And he said he's all set for Chicago. It'll be his next race. But the one thing that's a little off is Galen has not run a half marathon or a tune-up race ahead of Chicago. And he almost always does when he races a marathon. And he said earlier this summer when he spoke to Runners World, that was his plan was to run a tune-up race. So he hasn't raced at all since Chicago last year when he had the Achilles surgery. Or heel surgery, sorry. And remember, folks, there's been a number of times this year when Jonathan Galt has known things before the athletes themselves have actually realized this to be true. I think it's happened on two occasions. One I can remember is um, Brianna Williams, a sprinter, recently has tested positive. We heard this. Um, Jonathan reached out to Otto Bolden, her coach, and she had, he had not heard anything about it. And then a few weeks later, it proved to be true. And then there was the um, – also the uh, – we also heard – remember when we heard that uh, the 5,000-meter Drew, runner Drew Hunter would be pulling out of Worlds. John reached out to them. They said that he would not be pulling out of Worlds. But a few weeks later, he did pull out of Worlds. So Rupp is in Chicago for now, but let's see. But, it's, but you guys are praising that message board poster. I mean, it wasn't that hard for me to get on the message board and just – you know, I, I pretty much go on there before every marathon that Dathan Richenheim is committed to and say he's going to pull out. And then I look like a genius. Okay, admittedly, I didn't do that, but Rich is 36 now. He's he's been he was injury prone in his prime. He's still injury prone. But he's still going. That's the thing. Like you look at the guys he went to high school with, they were all in the same class, high school class of 2001, where 
Ryan Hall and Alan Webb, both of whom have long since retired. So Ritz, yes, he's had injuries, a fair amount of injuries during his career, but you got to respect him for continuing to battle through them. He says he's going to go through and run the trials and still contend. And, you know, who knows? He, he says he's back running now, but it's, uh, well, he said he was feeling good now. I assume he's back running. I'm not totally counting him out, but he's, he's really, uh, I feel bad for him with the injuries he's gone through. Cause it's just hard to run a good marathon without getting it logging that training. And I just don't think he, you can't trust him to show up and make it through 26.2 miles at a high level anymore. Right. But a lot of people probably could have said that before Meb, when Meb was getting in his mid to late thirties and Meb had, had quite, you know, Meb obviously had a better running career before his mid to late thirties, but Meb still had a big couple big hits after people were written him off. So you don't want to write out a talent, write off a talent like Ritz. I was kind of making fun of him, but you don't want to write him off until he is actually 100% officially retired. Remember, folks, this is the guy back in the day that I used to love. I predicted he would be the first white man to break the 27-minute barrier. I was off. Chris Zelensky took those honors. Right, but yeah, Robert, you pointed out, I mean, it's a good point you make, because earlier this year, he ran 61-24 in the half marathon. Ritz is, I mean, half marathon's always been Ritz, Ritz's best dif- distance, but... You know that's that's obviously very good. Sixty-one twenty-four. Not many Americans can run that. So he has the talent. It's just about keeping his body in one piece and you know getting the trials healthy and then making it through. Um, other Chicago-related news from this weekend: Philadelphia Hot Rock and Roll Half Marathon took place, and you had one woman tuning up for that for Chicago running it. That was Jordan to say, and. Result, fairly middling, 72-35. She got fourth place. She wasn't even the top American. She got beat by Becky Wade. I'm not freaking out about this result. I don't think Alberto Salazar, get on mention in, I don't think he'll be freaking out about this result. Uh, seems like she was in heavy training. I know she does has let it rip sometimes before some of her big marathons and tried to get in a big, a big time. But if she says she's happy with it and... I think that to me is a good sign. If she said, oh, this race, st-, like Des Linden, for comparison, ran 76.08, finished 13th, and she pretty much admitted, yeah, that result stunk. Maybe there's a reason to be worried for Des ahead of New York, but for Hase, if she's not worried, I'm not worried. It'd be interesting to look at the splits. Maybe we should have done this, but you know, if she went out hard and faded to that, I'd be maybe a little more worried, but you know, she can get a little appearance money to show up. She just goes and sort of tempos it because I, I don't know if the equivalent would be if some man went out and ran say like a 103 half or something i'd be like oh, okay that's not very good but if he's just kind of trying to cruise it or 104 maybe you know someone who thinks they can run 206 or something like that but if she's just kind of cruising a little sore of the marathon pace getting in a good workout i don't think much of it and the, you know in the past she hasn't run that fast before full marathons anyway without that history though or without her taking it easy it's a very troubling performance but she's she's shown she's made him run the marathon and she's shown she'd be ready when she's on the start line so i'm giving her every benefit of the doubt i i think she was doing it as a workout there was a message board poster that said that he saw her an hour after the race she skipped the award stand the award ceremony he said he saw her working out so maybe you know i, I used to want to run like 30k hard and stuff like that which obviously would be still going on an hour after the race but you know i i wanted to run a half marathon one time and then i was trying to think like how am i, am I going to Go, do I cross the finish line to turn around because I wanted to run with the aid stations? I was going to go the wrong way on a course. I ended up just entering a marathon instead and dropping out of the 30K mark. So uh, I think she probably was doing a workout. And considering last year she ran a full marathon faster than she did the half at Philly, I think there's no real reason to be worried, but 72 minutes isn't that fast. But the fact that she was happy about it, you know, I, I think that, you know, I mean, I don't think she's going to be Bridget Coast guy, obviously, in Chicago, but. Yeah, but no one is. No one in the world would bring, bring, bring a coast guy in Chicago. But I think the other thing, it was pretty warm, warm weather, hot, you know, pretty humid. And the biggest thing to me is just she's, she's healthy. She's out there running. Like last year, I know she made it through Boston and got third this year, but last year she had to withdraw from Boston and Chicago. So the fact that she's back and doesn't appear to have any health sit, sit back, setbacks that we know of, that's the biggest positive sign is that she's racing one month out from Chicago. As someone who's not racing, speaking of injuries, the Kenyan trials were last week, and we didn't necessarily expect this guy to race the Kenyan trials, Elijah Manangoy, the reigning world champion in the event. 
Um, and he did not race, but then afterwards it came out that he's not going to be doing Worlds. There will be a Manigoy at Worlds, though. His younger brother, the World Junior Medalist, George Manigoy, did make the team. But big, big, um, you know, disappointing, I, I think, for fans of the 1500. It's certainly a help for the American chances of a medal. I mean, I think if you look at that event, Elijah Manigoy is clearly the best in the world this year. Timothy Chariot. I mean, excuse me. Timothy Chariot is the best in the world. He's the heavy gold medal favorite. I'd probably put Jacob Ingebrigtsen second. And then after that, it's pretty wide open for who, who you claim would be the third best person. But that's really, you know, big news coming from Kenya. Yeah, that's actually, I want to talk to you about this. I'm going to put you guys on the spot. That third, I think I kind of see the event shaping up the same way, Robert, with Chariot and Ingebrigtsen as the two guys to beat. But with Chariot, you know, the heavy favorite over Ingebrigtsen, does an American get a medal in the men's 1500? Yes or no? This isn't even debatable to me. Yes. But does an American? No. Let's mention him by name, Matthew Shuntowitz. I know Weldon thinks that I'm the, I'm the leader of the Craig Ingalls fan club. I'm working on the prediction contest, folks, the running warehouse prediction contest. We'll have it up a week ahead of time this year. I've already started working on it. I almost didn't even put in Ingalls as an option for a medal. This guy's not winning a medal. But Matthew Shuntowitz, I got your back. Oh, it's about time. I about to say, when does an American get a medal and you guys said you're going to name a name, I thought you guys were going to trot out Craig Ingalls. So at least we're talking about Centrowitz. The odds are, I would say, about 50% that he gets a medal. It's looking good. I mean, the man in going noise, he must have done a little dance when he heard that news. But, hey, with man in going out, the 1500 is still a great. It's one of the premier events, you know, especially with Seb Cope trying to kill off the 5K and the 10K. It's only a quasi joke, but you know they lost one of their star players. But you still got Chariot, you got the Ingebrigtsen brothers, you got um, Centrowitz, and a host of others. So hey, don't 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 discount this guy, McLuthy. He's only run one fifteen hundred. He's run two fifteen hundred. He ran three thirty one, and people didn't realize it because he didn't place really high in that race. I think that was Paris. The three thirty one with his pedigree. I, I wouldn't be writing him out. This is what I want to see happen at Worlds. Tell me, you guys, if you want this. I want Chariot to win the gold. He's been so good. He deserves the gold medal. It makes me nervous. I always get nervous as a former coach. Like, I used to get nervous about Radish. I'm like, how is he going to lead from the front? It's impossible to lead from the front. You can't do it. By the way, Centrowitz did do that at the Olympics. So front's not a bad place to be. You don't have a lot of traffic. So I really hope he wins the gold. Then I want to see Jacob Ingebrigtsen. I, I would, don't want to see him medal. Everyone else is the hype train, the hype train, the hype train. I want to see Philip get the medal instead. Again, just put the little brother down. Even though I am the little brother in the in the in Walton Johnson, Robert Johnson twin battle. But for some reason, I don't like the hype. I want Centrowitz potentially to win the gold. If 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 Chariot doesn't win gold, I want Centro to win it. Prove it wasn't a fluke. But ideal scenario would be, would be Man and Goy one, Chariot one, Centro two, Philip Ingers and Branson three. Hold on. You want Centrowitz to win the gold to prove it wasn't a fluke. This is a guy who medaled at the 2011 World Championships, fourth at the 2012 Olympics, second behind a Dopa at the 2013 World Championships, and then won the Olympic gold medal and won World Indoors early that year. But you're concerned that his Olympic medal might be a fluke. Is that what you're saying? Correct. You put Centrowitz clean versus Kiprop clean. I'm going Kiprop clean every time. Despite the doping conviction, <laughs> we we don't know we we don't know what a clean kit prop looks like. We don't know if he was doping back in two thousand seven. We don't know when he started doping or if he, uh, this is uh, how do you what? Please tell me what a clean Asbel kit prop looks like, Robert. Well, John, please, kit prop still claims to be clean. Please give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt at this point. Well, he doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt because he's been banned by the IAAF, but he. I will mention he claims that he is clean and never doped. That, that was a total joke. All right, well, all joking aside, I do expect Centrowitz will medal. I don't think, as Robert said, that we don't even need to have a discussion about it. I mean, it's the 1500. Crazy things happen all the time. McCluffy, well, we always know he saves the good stuff for the Olympic year, so I'm not expecting him to do anything until 2020. But... Yeah, Centro, I mean, I don't think writing Craig Engels off is smart. He's been really good. He showed some tremendous racing chops at USA's. So tactically, that's very important if he's in the mix at Worlds. But yeah, Centro with that 13 flat 5K and his pedigree, and he says he's in really good shape. I do expect him to medal in Doha. I think the 
mood here is dropping a bit because it's late afternoon. I think we need a little more music and a new segment of Let's Run. Robert, please start dancing. There we go. Okay, we're going to have a new thing on Let's Run. It's called the term of the week. This week's term of the week is glowing. When an athlete pulled out of the world championships this week on Let's Run, there was just a one post on the message board, and it just said glowing, and it made me laugh. So for those of you who are uninformed, the term glowing is, it's like when you're worried that you may flunk a drug test. So you're glowing, you're giving off symptoms that you may test positive. So in theory, you don't compete when you're glowing. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, the Let's Run.com term of the week. I'll be very interested to see if term of the week lasts beyond one week and if this is an actual recurring segment or just a segment we've claimed to be recurring just so we can find an excuse to work it in this week. Well, we've learned those words that were used to describe us by the emailer a few weeks ago. That's remember? right. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the specific word. We should do it like once a month. Speaking of, well, people like to complain how I talk about myself. There's an LA, I think it's called LA Magazine. They have an article on Frank Meza. They have a number of words to describe me yet again this week. It actually came out last month, but I just saw it for the first time this week. Irreverent, John. Irreverent. Let's run the dot com. Co-founder. I read the article. I'd say that's that's accurate. Probably probably more accurate than a Texan Hugh Grant, to be honest. Don't tell my wife that. She thinks I'm quite handsome. I didn't I didn't call you ugly, Robert. I just said uh, you're not a Texan Hugh Grant. The term of the week a few weeks ago was Rojo's insouciance, Galt's perspicacity. Perspicacity. There, that is probably the word that has given the Let's Run staff the most trouble pronouncing it. Perspicacity. It's like spelled differently than I think it is. Roger's insouciance, Galt's perspicacity, and Ouija's humanity are my favorite parts of the podcast. So once again, everybody, right now, go to your favorite app that you're listening on and give us five stars. Thank you very much. Actually, if you want to give us feedback, you can go to letsrun.com slash podcast and leave your feedback right there. Or you can call 1-844-LETS-RUN. And like we got feedback this week, love the diverse topics, updates on national meets, even some drug talk, and that you mentioned women's and, and men's news. Also love discussion of what is wrong with the sport, as it is important. That's from Eric. So guys, keep them coming in. Uh, we also, I think, how about a question of the week before we sort of move on to other topics? How about my breaking news story of the week? People think that sometimes we're criticized for focusing on men's running. I don't. I disagree with that. I focus on what's interesting, folks. I'm going to break some stories here. I don't think I've seen this reported anywhere in the world. I've figured it out as the podcast has been going on. We talked about this young woman last week, Nora Geruto. John, do you remember reminding the viewers last week at the at a Prague 10,000 meter race, she ran 30:07 for 10k. Very impressive. And you said, "Wow, she's got to come back to the Kenyan trials in like four days." I've just realized. She's the world number two in the steeple this year. She's run 903. She was third in the Diamond League final, but she didn't come back for the Kenyan trials. She didn't even race it, and she will not be going to world. So we always talk about, like, this just shocks me. We talk about who's going to win the medal. It's such a big deal for the Americans. So apparently, some of the Kenyans are just skipping out on the world championship trials. They don't even bother. So what I, th- I want to say, this might have just been message board fodder, but I want to say – that Gerudo is, I, I heard, again, this is just rumor, but I heard she might be looking into changing her nationality. And it would make sense if that's the case that she wouldn't be running the Kenyan trials. So that's a big break for Courtney Fyrex and Emma Coburn. When the second fastest woman in the world, the third placer in the Diamond League final, doesn't go to Worlds. The Kenyan team, they still will get forged strong, and they're, you know it's a strong team. The top three of the Kenyan trials were holding hands, basically side by side. Beatrice Chipkowicz, Hyvin Kelling, and Selafine Chesspole, they all ran 945. And the fourth member of the team will be Fancy Toronto, who is five seconds back. So, you know, th- those are not chopped liver by any stretch of the main imagination. But, um, you know, Fancy Toronto is 24th in the world this year at 931. She's certainly not as good as Nora. Geruto at 9.03. But Kenya will still have the first, well, and with Geruto out, they've got the, have the first, the second seed, the fourth seed, and they got to find the other one here. Well, I, I can't find the other one. Daisy Chepkemai did not make the team. She is actually the fifth in the world this year. 
So they've got a, a, just a lot of women staplers in the top 10 in the world this year. So, well, then why don't you hit us question of the week? You teased it. What's your question? All right. Question of the week. I think it's relevant because world championships are coming up and we do need to continue to have a little world championship talk. One week from today, John, we'll be getting on the planes, heading to Doha. Wonderful Doha. This segment is sponsored by the Kingdom of Qatar or Qatar, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They will be giving John and I each one, half a million dollars each for our trip. It's a very wonderful trip. Actually, not, not true, but if the head of Qatar wants to do that, we will gladly take the money and write anything positive you want about your country. Thank you very much. Oh, speak for yourself. I don't, I don't think I would. I don't know about that. Well, then, if you want to sell out, go ahead. Half a million just to say something about a, a country where freedom of the press is already restricted and um, homosexuality is illegal. You know, I'll, I'll speak. I'll say positive things for a few weeks, then I'll come back to America and speak the truth. I guess you can put a price on integrity. So today's question of the week, it was submitted on the let's run.com slash podcast. Here it is. Do you think it would be worth it to consider giving the athlete who wins their respective event in the Diamond League final a buy into the final at the World Championships? This would encourage athletes to run the circuit, or would it inc- create a, too much of an unfair advantage for the athlete at Worlds? I think that would trump the wild card and encourage stack fields, but at the same time, I wonder if you're good enough to win a Diamond League final and you don't have to go to the Worlds, does that make you untouchable? Love the podcast, Lloyd. So, should they encourage people to run the Diamond League by giving the Diamond League winners buys into the final at Worlds? Two words. Hell no. I'm so firmly against this. What is so great? What's great about the 800 and the 1500, these events in particular, is it's hard to make the final. Like, you can get really good guys not making the final. Nigel Amos didn't make the final in Rio or the 2015 Worlds. I mean, it's just... I love watching those races. You get to see who looks good in the rounds. And it's also just a level playing field. It's not fair to ask someone in the 1500 to run three rounds in four days, and then they come back for the final against someone who's fresh. I want to see everyone go through the same thing. I'm totally against these buys to the final. It's not fair that the New England Patriots only have to play three playoff games to win the Super Bowl every year when other teams, the wildcard teams, have to play four, John. Yeah, but that's different. It's not as big an advantage. The Patriots are they, there are four teams that get that advantage every year, and they earn them. I get, I, I get that it's a similar situation, but I don't, I don't like it. I just don't. I think in the NFL, it's a good carrot and it leads to good competition. But I don't like having a buy to the final and like the eight hundred. I mean, mate, even in the sprint events, no, I, I don't like this at all. I like the idea of the emailer, but I think it's unnecessary. Someone pointed out on the message board a few weeks ago, we had the discussion, like, what well, can get more athletes, incentivize more athletes to do the Diamond League? And they essentially said, like, hey, it's sort of, it's not true that athletes are really skipping the Diamond League final. Most of the top athletes in the world are doing it. And you sort of looked at it, and it's actually true. So, like, who didn't do, name me some top athletes who didn't do it. I mean, we were critical of Jerry Schumacher's athletes. But by and large, they're not the top athletes in the world. Most of the top athletes in the world did the Diamond League final. So... I don't know if Courtney Frerichs could have gotten a buy into the steeplechase final, would she have showed up at the diamond league final? No, it wouldn't have made a difference for her because she's going to make the steeplechase final anyway. So I like the idea, the concept of incentivizing athletes to do the diamond league and do important meets. But I think in this instance, it's not necessary. And that reminds me that emailer gets a Floyd's of Leadville certified CBD product. We got to get those prizes out to them. Yeah, I I agree. I, I like the idea but I don't think I'd put them straight in the final. I might let them skip one of these preliminary rounds and the sprints, but I'm not opposed to treating people, you know, differently. If I was the head of USATF, I would have like anyone ranked in the top 10 in the world at Olympic trials. If they fall start in the prelims, that's okay. Not in the final, but in the prelims, like the worst case scenario, people say they fall start. If you fall start in the final, you're tossed. But if you fall start in the prelims, I'd let them do it again. So I am, I am fine with rewarding excellence like they do in most sports. I mean, tennis, the top seeds get an easier draw. In American football, you get a buy in the playoffs, et cetera. More breaking news. I actually, while y'all were talking though about that, we talked about Nord, the number two steeper in the world not running because she's switching allegiances. I can report that the fifth ranked steeper in the world, Daisy Chep Kami, who's run 906 this year, she also didn't run the Kenyan trials. So it appears that two of the top six women in the world, two of the top five women in the world are not going to be at Worlds. Now, Kenya will still have three of the top five entrants 
because they're so good at the steeple. But I assume she's changing allegiances too. Yeah, I mean, the the source we have for that is there was a post on the Lights for a Message board that said they're both going after Kazakhstan citizenship, which Kazakhstan has poached some Kenyans in recent years. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they're saying on the message board, and it would explain their absence. The one other thing, though, about this this buy for the Diamond League, I mean, I just think you're fundamentally changing the, the rules if you're putting them straight in the final, because the whole thing is there's championship racing, and which we've decided is the highest level of the sport. And then there's Diamond League and the other professional meets. And the two big differences is there's no pacemakers in the championships and there's rounds. And by eliminating the rounds for one athlete, even though if it's a, it's a product of them being superior to their peers, I just think you're changing the rules too much. Like the, one of the thing, the toughest thing is to go through three rounds and then be ready to deliver your best performance at the final lap of that final round. And Eliminating that challenge it makes me less interested. Well, the, the thing I don't like about it is it, it was just it would be more. Why would I bother to watch the prelims if those big stars aren't in it? So, my number one complaint about the sport is so much of it is practice or, or, or meaningless. So, I would like the rounds of, of worlds to mean something. But I, I, I'm not opposed to people thinking outside the box. So, good A for effort, not you know C or D for I'm not C. I, I'd say B or C for you know, something that would actually work. Yeah, no, I, I love inter- listening to interesting ideas for the sport. This is an interesting idea. I just uh, ha- happen to personally disagree with that. All right. And rounding out our weekly segments, how about this one? Training tip of the week. Weldon, you want to take this? Yes. In case you guys missed it, Woody Kincaid, the most famous American middle distance runner, long distance runner, everyone's favorite, who half of you had never heard of until last week. He ran 12.58. And he had some interesting comments after the race and sort of immediately after the race. And then last week he went on a podcast with Chris Chavez of Sidious Mag. And essentially immediately after the race, they're like, can you believe you ran sub 13? He's like, I can't believe even now that I'm in sub 13 shape. So there was some self doubt. And then Emery Mort employee 1.0 of let's run.com was at the race and talked to Woody and he had been standing next to Rob Connor um, his college coach during the race. And he said, you know, at one point Connor was like, yeah, what do you, what he's not looking that good. So his college coach thinks he doesn't look that good and he still runs sub 13. And then afterwards it came out on the podcast that Woody said before the race, he went up to Jerry and it's like, look, I, I may think I may be getting sick. I really don't want to run this race. And Jerry Schumacher's like, no, you're running this race, man. And he goes, 12.58 for 5K. So my, my training tip of the week is people, trust your training. Everything doesn't have to feel perfect during the race, before the race, or even after the race. You got to get the most out of your body right then. And if you've put in the work, it's amazing what the human body can do. And sure, there's going to be times you're sick and you just don't have it. But you don't know in, uh, until you like get out there and give it your best. And it sounds like from like every indication or like, Woody, for whatever reason, just didn't think it'd be that, this good. Um, but it was tremendous. Can you imagine what would have happened if he didn't race? Like he gets it. Well, he would never have known he was in 1258 fitness, but he runs one 5K in July, doesn't get the standard, runs USA's, gets third, and then trains for two months and just ends his season without doing a race, even though he got super fit. I mean, that would have been pretty nuts progression. So it's a good thing he did get out there and race and get that time next to his name. Okay, here's a question for you guys related to this. Since I'm obsessed with this book I started listening to, the Win book by Daniel Pink. There's an optimal time to like train and do different things during the day. And I think for sports, it's like afternoon or evening actually might be better. For me, that was the case. I mean, I ran great at night and I ran shit in the marathon in the morning. So what is the time adjusted time for Woody Kincaid middle of the day you know we joked last week you put him in a diamond league meet what does he run but I wonder if like running late at night like maybe he's just primed to run late at night I mean that could be worth a couple seconds for somebody it was perfect weather perfect pacing I mean it's kind of nuts that Mohamed rabbited them 4600 meters but you know it shows like optimal conditions all these other factors go into what you can do but the key is you got to take advantage of what's presented you know at you at that time and Woody may never, ever get circumstances like that to run again. But also the wonderful thing for him now is like 
even if the circumstances and conditions helped him, in his mind, he's like, I'm a 1258 guy. And I think that's going to do wonders for him. And the mental side is huge for me. I mean, obviously, yes, you have to be tremendously talented. You have to have the physical talent and get all of that ready. But like mentally, I think this is going to do wonders for him. It'll be really interesting to see what he does next year. Yeah, it, an interesting thing you bring up, Weldon, with the time uh, is professional football players like Tom Brady goes to bed at like 9 p.m. every night. He's like famous for going to bed early. Yet when they play at night, those games kick off at like 8.20. They're not over until like 11.30 or almost midnight. And yet he's still out there performing you know, near his peak. It's pretty interesting to me that some of these players, many NFL players, a lot of basketball players, they're being asked to perform at their best at like 11 p.m. at night. And I wonder if that, how that all fits into this whole thing. If only I had, John, if I would tried to be an NBA player instead of a marathon runner in the morning. Oh, gosh. I can't believe Wells is falling for this psycho babble. Like, it drives me nuts when I have to hear in the NFL how a West Coast team can't play a 1 o'clock game because they're still going to be tired. Get up a little bit early, people. Give me a freaking break. The reason why Weldon – well, never mind. I won't bash Weldon's marathon running. Well, hey, this look, this is why – Breaking 2. What time did Breaking 2 take place? About 6 a.m. in the morning. Why'd they do it? Because Kipchoge, that's when he trains in Kenya. Same thing. Why did they choose Vienna for the location? It's because it was only a time zone or two away from Kaptegat. And they're doing it early in the morning again because that's where he feels, that's where he does all his training. That's where he's most comfortable doing it. So certainly Elliot Kipchoge thinks it has a lot to do with uh, how well he runs is what time he, he runs the race at. Though I'm, I think... Kipchoge would be a pretty good marathoner, even if he raced in the afternoon or evening. If only the Olympic trials, if they'd only been at night, the marathon trials, I'd probably be an Olympian. I'm putting an asterisk. I'm going to call myself an Olympian with an asterisk. Thank you. Night Olympian. Yeah. Weldon Johnson. I mean, we make all these accommodations for people nowadays. Like, why couldn't I be accommodated? Well, do we have anything else to talk about? Deleted threads of the week. I do have some more important news. I should have actually teased it in the opener. I know Weldon's sky high about this event. So I guess I'll go into that since I don't hear anything from you guys. Big, big news in the college cross-country scene, folks. Yale has beaten Harvard, both on the men's and women's side, surprisingly on the men's side for sure. Harvard, folks, this is the reason why you should never go to flow track. Harvard was ranked 16th in the country, according to flow track in their preseason poll, which is like a joke. I mean, they were second in the Ivy League last year, but 16. Like, there hasn't been – there's been, like, one Ivy League team in maybe 10 years has been top 20 in the country. So why would Harvard be, be that – be ranked in the top 20 when Princeton, I think, has like wins the Ivy League every year and has, like, everybody back? It just – it made no sense. Anyways, I was shocked to get an email. I, even though I didn't run for Yale or go to Yale, I'm on the Yale alumni email list. And it said that Yale beat Harvard. I called Weldon up, and, Weldon, is this the best news you've heard in sports news? five, 10 years. It's tremendous. I mean, people got their sports goals, like, like people wanted the Chicago Cubs to win the world series and their life was complete when it happened. A lot of people's life never was complete because it didn't happen when they're alive. And fortunately the Dallas Cowboys won three or four Super Bowls when I was in college, Texas Rangers made two world series. Now I'm kind of wondering if I might be like a Chicago Cubs fan, but the Yale Bulldogs have not won the heptagonal cross country since the war. No, not the Gulf War, not the Vietnam War, World War II. I'm sure Princeton's still supposed to win, but this is encouraging. Harvard had the Heps individual champion last year. He was only third. So if any young UIs are listening, guys, you're very talented. I know you have talent. You're way better than anyone else back in the day. All you got to do is do your best on, I'm not sure even when the Heps are, probably like November 1st. Is it New York City Marathon weekend? Yes, it is. October 31st, somewhere in there? Yes. Just do your best that day. Do your Woody Kincaid. And it may surprise you. But that's one of my lifelong sports goals is for Yale to win the cross-country hips. And, okay, yeah, email us at podcast at letsrun.com. I want to hear some of the longest losing streaks in sports. Is there anyone almost worse than this in track and field that Yale hasn't won an 18 league in 70, oh, my gosh, almost like 80 years now? It's kind of nuts. So is this the biggest losing streak in the history of track and field slash cross-country? Go Bulldogs. I haven't bothered to look it up. I assume it's likely, in large part, a situation which would drive me nuts if this is the case. Harvard just pulled a Georgetown and didn't enter their top guys. I mean, I know they had their top guy there and he got third, but supposedly he sprained his ankle with like 800 meters left. So, but it, like, 
if they didn't enter like their top guys, the other guys for whatever reason, like why even bother to have the meet? Remember last week Georgetown lost to Johns Hopkins, a Division three school, because they ran like their JV team. So it just to me when I saw this result, I'm like, this is a joke. Teams aren't even racing one of the few rivalries that means anything in sports. You know, Army, Navy, Harvard, Yale, etc. You can't rant on it until you look it up. So let's go look it up. We'll post it in the show notes. I want that posted in the show notes. You got to look it up. You can't have a theoretical rant that Harvard like sat some guys. For all I know, Yale beat them fair and square. They beat the Heps champion. He was third. It was a good race. I'm going to take it. Rivalry means something. I'm glad that Yale takes it seriously and they won the meet. So there. Okay. But well, just I can't go on a rant. I guess I could try to call the coaches. Alex Gibby, who's the new distance coach at Harvard, is doing a great job. He used to be at William Mary and Michigan. He's a fantastic coach. Um, and I know one of their top runners, they had like two from the top five from Hebsback last year. One of them's hurt, so he didn't run. So one of their top number two runner didn't run. But well, it's like I can't go on this. I, mean, I guess I'd have to call him to find out because these college sports information departments, remember, well, then, a D1 team will lose to a D3 team, and then it'll be presented on the website as, oh, we did great this weekend. So you literally, short of a phone call to the coach, which immediately us as media members could make, and I do have his number on my phone, you know, it's like the alumni will send out, they'll send out an email to the alumni list and not even say, oh, we didn't run anyone or whatever. So when the sports information departments don't treat these as legitimate sporting events, it's hard for fans to do so as well. All right, well, well, you tried to keep Robert from ranting, and I think that Robert rants are a big part of this podcast, what they're about. I enjoy them. So I'm going to encourage one right now. I'm looking at our notes for this podcast and what we're going to talk about, and we have two potential topics on. One, it says, pull the plug on modern society, and the other one is Rojo rant about terrible journalism. Robert, I'm going to give you dealer's choice. Go on a rant. Which of these topics do you want to talk about? I'll go with... Pull the plug in modern society. The second one, Weldon had to talk to me out of I, – I wrote an article which was totally politically oriented. It was not sports oriented. And Weldon, who one time wrote an article on Let's Run about who he voted for in a presidential election, talked me out of, out of publishing it. So I, I don't want to upset 50% of the country. It really wasn't a political thing. It was just about how bad journalism is. I'm not sure right now this week we're able to go there with the bad journalism considering our – David Rudisha article that was up this week briefly had some focus on what was in the background of this article and we corrected it. But David Rudisha is at an interesting point in his life. And it seems like there's sort of this public feud being played out with his wife. And then he got in a very serious car wreck at 2 a.m. And nothing good is happening at 2 a.m. But you're sort of wondering, like, what's he doing out at 2 a.m.? And, you know, but, you know, all journalists make some mistakes, some worse than others. So, Robert, all right, what's wrong with modern society? Go. Well, 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 it's criticizing my journalism. I mean, David Rudisha did put out an Instagram post. It's like these people are putting stuff on Instagram. Something behind him was either a legs doll or a sexual toy. I mean, a a doll's leg, a legs doll, a doll's leg or a sexual toy. All we did was ask, what is this? Considering this guy's life has been kind of bizarre this summer, I, I thought it was an appropriate question to ask. But anyways, pulling the plug in modern society, it's just so depressing. In the last week, folks, do you realize who's been linked to PEDs, potentially linked to PEDs? Both Tim Tebow, the Christian hero and my favorite quarterback, and Justify, the triple crown winning horse. Folks, well, Tebow, let's start with Justify. Justify did fail a drug, drug test and should have never been in the Kentucky Derby, so should never be a triple crown winner. So that is just a fact. Justify is a doper or was doped. I assume the horse didn't dope itself voluntarily he's a victim justify is a victim there's no question right i mean the poor little guy he just wanted to run. apparently he, there is some grain that you can eat that can also cause you to test positive but regardless should not have been the triple crown now tim tebow is a little bit more interesting i think his trainer a guy that he raves about in his book for his miraculous recovery abilities um is being sued by some sort of olympic athlete who also used that trainer and and, and they tested positive and were busted by anti-doping authorities and it's because this they claim this trainer was giving them PEDs without them knowing it. So perhaps the miraculous recovery that Tim Tebow was getting was also PEDs. I assume if he did get them, it was not intentional and he didn't know it. But Walton, why don't you share with the visitors your link to PEDs? I'm not sure where you're going here. 
Well, back in the day when Tiger Woods was in his prime, some people got Matt said Tiger Woods was linked to PEDs because his Canadian trainer. Oh yeah, Doctor Galea. I have seen Doctor Galea. I actually I have two links to PEDs. I went and saw this doctor, Doctor Galea, in Toronto. I went and saw the physical therapist first, who was recommended by Dan Path one of the geniuses in sport who was the then assistant coach at Texas when I was there one year. And now it's like one of the head coaches at Altus. And he said, go see this physical therapist. He told me these amazing things that Donovan Bailey did. Like he essentially like blew out a hamstring or groin, I think before the 96 Olympics and somehow saw this guy and did this like crazy manipulation, just through an area part of the body to get to the groin. If you're thinking about where someone's going to stick a finger, supposedly that's pretty crazy. So I went and saw this doctor. Turns out this doctor later was busted for bringing HGH across the border. Everything was clean and above board with me. And then also there's a New York Times article that starts off with with my name, Weldon Johnson. And it's on the performance enhancing effects of caffeine. So there you are, me, one of the suspected dopers in the sport. But I think, you know, if this Tebow doctor is dirty, it just shows you it actually shows you what's sort of alleged about Alberto Salazar that one trainer or one coach may be doping some athletes, but not all the athletes. Because Kara and Adam Goucher, they never said, hey, we were doped. They're saying, hey, Alberto tried to dope us. It made us feel unquestionable, but may have been doping other athletes. So it's kind of interesting, you know, dichotomy there. All right. Well, I don't think I'm quite ready to pull the plug on modern society yet uh, because a horse – tested positive for a substance that shouldn't have taken. And Tim Tebow is linked indirectly to PDs. I think I'm still okay with society, but uh, thanks for getting uh, awareness out there, Robert, of these pressing issues. Um, Guys, I feel a little bit embarrassed, but there really is some breaking news right now. Have you guys not heard this? I was just double checking threads of the week to have a thread of the week, see the most popular thread. There's also a thread of the last hour. Galen Rupp out of Chicago. Galen Rupp out of Chicago. Even bigger. Out of the World Championships, an athlete. Noah Lyles? Women's 1,500 meters. Laura Muir. Nope. Shelby Houlihan. Nope. Less of a surprise. Faith Kipion. Nope. Glowing, John. Glowing. John, use the word of the week. Glowing. Oh, Debaba. This isn't news. Debaba out of the World Championships. Yeah. This was a few, this came out a few days ago. Oh, it did? Yeah. What? Okay. Why isn't the number one thread this hour right now? Well, probably the same reason because someone started a thread about it. Some an Ethiopian journalist posted about this on Twitter uh, a few days ago, saying that I wasn't enti- I wanted to see a corroborating report, but they he was saying to Baba, I don't think he's is running worlds. John, everyone knows until it's on Let's Run, it's not official news. So, did we have it on Let's Run? We did not. I have it ranked as the seventh most popular thread of the last hour, according to my stats. I know, but it's climbing up. It just got posted. Well, then call this bi- you call this bigger news than than Rupp's scratching from Chicago. Yeah, I disagree about that. No way. I disagree with that, or at least from an American standpoint. Rupp's scratching from Chicago would be much bigger news against Zebe Dababa, someone who very few people are big fans of. You know, pulling out, but this is devastating news to me, actually. And thank you for letting me hear about this, Weldon. This is a killer to Jenny Simpson's. Stable chance medals for 2020. God, Jenny, I mean, Jenny Simpson and Shelby Houlihan are going to be like the only two women on the start line in the world's, particularly if Mira pulls out. Okay, real quick. I think we need to have a little world stock. Next week, we're going to have a ton of world stock, and then we'll probably have a special podcast once John and I are in Doha. What race are you looking forward to next? I want a sprint race and a distance race you're most looking forward to. Go. Well, this is obvious. Yeah, 400 hurdles, men. And women. I mean, both. What's wrong with either one of them? But the men, for sure. I mean, I, I expect the world record to go down in that race. I, If all three of them were healthy, I think we could have three people break the world record in the same race, which would be maybe the greatest track race in history of track and field. Um, men's 400 hurdles, definitely. Women's 400 hurdles is not bad. Obviously, the men's 100 and 200 are other sprint races that I just got to pay attention to on, on both sides. I mean, the men's 100, Christian Coleman is obviously the heavy favorite, but he hasn't raced in so long. That's a really intriguing race for me. And, and it's very much wide open. You know, I, I was doing some research on that for the prediction contest. On Eddie Gross, I, I wouldn't sleep on him. He, he's he's in good form. So running seasonal best in both the 100 and 200 last two races. So John and I agree on that. Distance race, John, 
Which one are you most looking forward to? There are that many that I'm super excited about, to be honest. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in to see just what happens with all these women's 1500 runners. If Hassan runs, is Houlihan healthy, Muir, Kipigon? There's so many question marks. So I think that's an intriguing event. I, I would say probably men's 800. I'm very interested to see how Donovan Brazier fares, Nigel Amos. I think that could be a great showdown, you know, if they both make it to the final. That's just a very, uh, that might be the most interesting one to me because I do think Brazier has a legitimate shot at gold. And then men's men's 10K, there's so much talent in the men's 10K. I think that one should be terrific. And I agree with the 400 hurdles. I think for me, the men's eight, but it's interesting about the 400 hurdles. And I think this will be interesting next year for the Diamond League. Because if you, if you, they're going to start scrapping events possibly. And I think a couple of years ago, if you said, what event are we getting rid of? I think a lot of people would have said, get rid of the 400 meter hurdles. And now both men and women, it's probably one of the premier events. So if you get an event, especially a track event, you know, are, really, are you really going to want to bring it back? Or are people going to keep competing in it? I mean, some events are unique, right? Like what's a 110 meter hurdle we're going to do? They're going to keep 110 meter hurdling. But other events, if, if you drop it, they're going to, people are going to shift up or down at an event they might try to just to try to make a living. So I think the sport needs to be careful in what they drop. Or That's why I think sort of reducing the frequency of some events might be better than dropping them. I'm most excited about the men's 1500. I mean, I'm really excited. I want to see, I told you why earlier. I want to see Managoy win. I want to see Centro. You got the Ingebrigtsens. But I, I think the, all the events are, are, are very exciting to me. I mean, 10, men's 10K is, is big for me. You got some real studs in there. That's going to be exciting. Um, but even right, we're running the 5K first this time. So we're going to have one of the, we're going to have Jacob Ingebrigtsen in that. It'll be interesting to see. You know, there's just a lot of different things. And then whatever, we still don't know right, what Hassan's doing. So on the women's side, whatever she's running, I want to watch. Absolutely. And then obviously the women's 1500 is going to be big. A.G. Wilson's bigger than the 800. The steeplechase is going to be, I mean, like what, you know, maybe the 800 is not the most exciting event on the women's side, but it's still exciting for American fans. Like there's not really, I would say, the, how about this? Which which event is are you least excited about? I would say men's 5,000 and men's steeple. But I think I think the men's steeple, there's potential for just utter wackiness in there. Like, who the hell knows what's going to happen? Hillary Bohr could medal. Conceslos Kipruto, he might just show up and suddenly he can kick. Like, who the hell knows what's going to go on in that race? That is not the star power we normally have, but I think there's potential for craziness is off the charts. And I disagree. I was about to say the 5K, actually, I'm kind of looking forward to it. You got Jacob Ingerbitz, and, and that'll be before the 1500, right? So is he a medal threat in that event? If it's sort of a tactical race and you have great Ethiopians, I mean, have they even announced their team yet? And only one Kenyan, which diminishes it, but that means Chalimo has got a better chance. So I think there's still some interesting f- plot lines in the 5k, even though, God, you know, the 5k really may be diminished with it's, with it's being kicked out of the diamond league, but hopefully there can be a great sort of tactical race. If Ingebrigtsen can get in there, uh, you know, the European TV, they love having w- one of their own in there. And I think, what happens in Europe sort of helps drive the direction of the sport. So that would be good for the future of the 5k. Yeah. I think the, look, the one event, I think the most boring women's 800, like we know who's going to win. We know it's going to happen in that race. I know I can tell you exactly how the final will play out. RJ Wilson will go to the front. She'll get the lead at the bell and she'll just control the race from there. That's exactly how it will go. She will win the gold medal. There you go. Come back and play this in a month from now. And that's going to be what happened. John, I think you're just way oversimplifying how easy that is and how vulnerable she is to getting beat. Well, then, she's lost one race to a non-XY DSD woman since the start of 2017. One. How is, she, how is that vulnerable in any way? You give me three to one odds, I'll, t- I'll bet the field. I think we need to come up with a bet when we're in Doha about that race. Three to one. I mean, here's the thing. All right, here's how dominant a favorite is. You're going one athlete against the field, and you're still demanding three to one odds to make you take it. That should tell you how big a favorite she is. Good point, John. No arguing, guys. You guys are gonna have to. Are you guys sharing a transatlantic flight, or are you guys flying separately? I have a direct flight out of Boston. It's we both wonderful. have direct flights. Doha Airlines, Qatar Airlines has direct flights from Boston and New York. Also, there's hotel packages. You can get discounts on the flight. There's a special IWF code. Email me if you still want to go to Worlds. I'll give you the code. Um, in the code, you can Google it. It's on the IWF website. There's only a couple hotels that have alcohol there. I know you guys are in one. Are you guys going to also just like check some beer in your bags just to be sure? <laughs> well, 
Well, I think we got we were trying to get into a hotel with alcohol, but then we got bumped out because they I think they were sold out. So I think we're near a hotel with alcohol. But well, then correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, we're no longer at the one media hotel with beer. I will not be checking alcohol in my bag. I do not want to go to jail when I get to Qatar. So alcohol and homosexuality are outlawed. But can you gamble at least? Like sports gambling? I don't know. We don't know. But I, I didn't realize the men's fight. I mean, with only one Kenyan. We only got one Kenyan. Like you should battle there. Hell, I mean, what are the odds of all three Kenyans doing well? Considering one of them ran twelve. You know, they ran their PRs in June six, which was quite a long time ago. Their seasonal best. Actually, speaking of gambling, one thing before we go. This weekend, our two teams, the New England Patriots and the Dallas Cowboys. Both of them are 20 plus point favorites in their games. That doesn't happen very often, people, in the NFL. Patriots are favored by 23 at home against the Jets. Cowboys by 21 and a half at home against the Dolphins. Robert, do both of those teams cover this weekend? I'm going to say no. I think that the hype train is a little bit high for the Cowboys right now. It's my main takeaway on this season. We've beaten two of the worst teams in the football league. A bunch of teams have beaten up some, on some really bad teams, and people are going crazy. We're 2 and 0. Great. We've beaten the Giants, who are god awful, and the Redskins, who aren't great either. So, you know, and now we're playing the worst team in football. So we'll be three and zero. But we'll basically play three of the worst teams in football to be three and zero. We just look at some of these teams' schedules, like the Cleveland Browns. They're about to lose five games in a row because they're playing some sick teams. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was looking. There was some power rankings recently, and the bottom four teams in the league were like the Dolphins, the Redskins, the Giants, and the uh, Jets. The Patriots play those teams a total of six times this season. So that's basically six free wins for the Patriots. So it's pretty, that's enough Patriots talk. I know people don't want to hear me talk about that. I'm a bit offended, John, that the the Patriots are bigger favorites than the Cowboys. The Cowboys are playing the worst team in the NFL, but I have a new stat for football fans. The Cowboys have scored nine touchdowns and one field goal this year. You should just look at like touchdown to field goal ratio. I think like historically, like three to one is pretty much like as good as it gets. There's no way the Cowboys keep that up over a season. Everyone talks about red zone percentage, that sort of stuff. But like how many touchdowns are you getting per field goal? If the Cowboys score nine touchdowns for every field goal, we will win the Super Bowl this year and we'll probably go 19 and 0. So <laughs> we'll, we'll probably go 19 and 0. Well, I guess if you're saying you keep that rate up, but the talk out of Dallas already is there's already concern that the Cowboys will go 16 and 0 and lose in the first round of the playoffs. Is that a successful season or not? I can't a 60 and no talk as someone who lives in New England. I'm kind of used it does happen every couple of years. Dallas, I mean, you guys haven't even made the NFC Championship game since like in 20 24 years. I can't believe this 60 and no talk in Dallas. That's crazy. Though they do have a good team this year. Well, that about does it for this week's podcast. I can't wait to next week. We'll we'll record on Wednesday, I believe, as usual. You guys are flying to Doha, so that means it'll be the Road Joe show solo. By myself. Can't wait. Yeah, you finally get to emulate your uh, idol, Colin Cowherd, and do a, a solo roadie, ro- uh, solo radio show, Robert. Well, he ha- he now has some, you know, he has like a good looking girl that does there. And occasionally like the one of the male producers says a word or two. So we can move you guys to minor roles in the show. Now, I think you guys are going to be on the podcast, right? Correct? Planning on it. I'm going to start my own side podcast. You know, like your side gig or your side chick. It's called the Rojo Rant Podcast. That's when I can go off on my journalism rant. Yeah, that that podcast will be banned by the FCC within about three weeks of its first episode. So uh, good luck with that, though, Robert. All right, everyone. Till next week. Everybody look for the Running Warehouse World Prediction Contest. That should be out there this weekend on the website. And it's time to get excited. World Championship track and field in September and October. I don't think it gets any better than this. See you next week.